So Trump was the only president who did not start a war. So I, all this stuff about he's scary, he's dangerous. I look at their track record. He's, he, he's a guy. Hello, everyone. Today, our guest is Jim Rickards, an economist and geopolitical expert, delves into the nitty gritty on why the market needs to stop banking on more than one rate cut from the Fed, how Wall Street has been wrong for two years, and the looming threat of commercial property held by the banks. Subscribe now, hit that bell icon, and embark on an enriching journey toward financial success. Let's unlock the potential of these markets together and pave the way for a brighter financial future. Welcome aboard. So you have to think think a little bit like Jay Powell. Now, what is his greatest fear? Uh, his greatest fear is that inflation gets out of control, which it almost was in 2023 and 2022. You go back to um, uh, late 2022 when inflation took off. And of course, these, it's you know, the word was transitory, was transitory, transitory, transitory. Well, it, it wasn't really transitory. It's still here. Um, it, it peaked in uh, June 2022 at 9.1%. Uh, it it's come down a lot. Uh, it's around, it's in the, in the low three. So 3.1, 3.2, 3.3%. But here's what happened. It got stuck. It was, uh, so when it went from nine to eight to five to three, everyone said, oh, the Fed's got this. They've got inflation under control, et cetera. But remember, their target is two. And you say, well, three, two, eh, it seems like they're close. Well, close isn't good enough if your target is two. And by the way, 3% inflation cuts the value of the dollar in half in uh, 18 years. Uh, so from birth to going off to college, your dollar's worth half. And by the time you get mid-career, you're 36 years old, half again. So 3% inflation is not benign. It actually really um, uh, it takes a uh, it takes a whack at um, sorry I said eighteen years I meant to say twenty two years but the the point's the same in a rel relatively short period of time from birth to mid career your your dollars lost seventy five percent of its value with three percent inflation sorry so the Fed's trying to get to do but the problem is that it, inflation was three percent right now just to be clear when I say inflation I'm talking about headline CPI consumer price index headline inflation three percent. And immediately, you know, the Wall Street crowd will jump up out of the seats. Oh, well, Jim, you know, we have core inflation. We we take out gas and uh, we take out energy and uh, food prices. And we, we, we're looking at core inflation. So, well, you may be looking at core inflation, but everyday Americans are not. You, you, gas, gas at the pump and, and food at the supermarket is about like two thirds of most people's budget. It's what they spend other than housing and home heating. Uh, it's what they spend most of their money on. So you can't you can't just pull out the things you don't like and say, let's look at the core. Well, mm -hmm. you can look at it, but everyday Americans are not. They're looking at gas prices and eggs and butter and milk and, and, and everything else they buy at the supermarket. So I use headline core because that's what Americans use. And if you want to understand the political aspects of this or how people are going to vote in November or what the Fed should really be worried about, that's the number. And then they came up with something. Uh, th these are basically people who don't have enough to do. Um, so when, once they got core, you know, they took out food and energy. Oh, don't count that. Then they took out housing and they called it super core. Uh, I'm, I'm not making this up. Oh, yeah. this, this is all in the literature. Uh, you can just Google super core. You'll see what I mean. So it's like, oh, OK, I get it. You took out energy, food and housing uh, and to get to what you think is relevant. OK, you you're so detached from everyday Americans. You're so detached from the real uh, what, what what real people are paying for, you know, the things they need that uh, no wonder they get everything else wrong. So um, so I'm talking about headline CPIs, but, but here's my point. Headline CPI was 3% in, uh, so we're in March, 3% uh, in about six months ago. Right now it's 3.2. It's higher than it was six months ago. Now it, it fluctuated in the meantime, it got as high as 3.7. It got down to 3.1, back up to 3.2, et cetera. I'm not saying inflation is going to 20%. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is it's not going to 2%. It's not going to the Fed's target. And it is not mission accomplished. The Fed has not solved the inflation problem, and they're still doing it. So they're nowhere, red, they're nowhere near ready to cut rates, number one. Number two, um, 
the Fed does not do anything quickly, uh, only in an emergency. And I mean a, a complete financial meltdown of the kind, you know, I lived through in 1998 with long-term capital management. Uh, that was, we, you know, we almost took down the world. It came very close. Um, but there the Fed had cut rates at a scheduled meeting and then cut them again two weeks later at a, a, an unscheduled meeting. The Fed can have an emergency meeting with a, they have an executive committee. They can act between scheduled dates. And they did in that case. And they, um, they lowered the rates again, just to kind of put, and then, then the market said, okay, I guess they're serious. Now we will start to normalize. So, um, but that's very unusual. Normally they uh, not only stick to their schedule, but they want to see three or four months worth of good data. Not one month, not one good month. I thought, gee, unemployment went down, inflation went down, let's cut rates. No, they want that because that could be an anomaly. Sometimes it is. Um, they want to see three or four months in a row. They haven't had that. They haven't had that. It just went up in the most recent month. CPI and PPI, which were just released, uh, you know, not long, just in the last few days, both went up. Um, now, again, I'm not talking 10%. I'm not talking 5%. I'm saying wrong direction. And if you're the Fed, there's no way you want to cut rates at this point. So we, we are, I can already tell you what they're going to do in March. They're not going to do anything. Okay. What's interesting about that is that Jay Powell at the end, it was either, I think it was January 31st was the last meeting. He did something I've never seen him do or any Fed chairman do. He said, we're not going to raise rates in March. They never do that. They, the, what they say is we're leaning this way, but we were data dependent. We want to see more data. It could go this way. It could go that way, but kind of they'll, they'll, hint that they're going to fade one way or the other, maybe raise rates. It's the no drama fed. They don't want any shocks. But I was shocked that he said, we're not raising rates in March. Uh, and so, okay, that's, that's an easy one. So then they have meetings in, um, I don't have the calendar in front of me, but I think it's May, uh, maybe May, June, July. Uh, if, if it's not May, it's the end of April. But uh, it, there are three more meetings and then no meeting in August and then a meeting in September. Okay. So based on what I said, we know they're not going to raise rates in March. They're not going to raise them. I believe June is the next meeting. They're not going to raise them in June. July, maybe, maybe, although the you know, Wall Street's betting June, but we'll see. Maybe July, but I kind of doubt it. Now, what about September? Well, on November 5th, we have a presidential election. Uh, and everyone says the Fed's not political. That's nonsense. They're one of the most political institutions you'll ever find. They do a very good job of pretending they're not political. They keep politics out of the FOMC statement. They keep politics out of the uh, press conference. They never, and they say, we're not political. They are highly political. They look at the same things we're looking at. Do they, uh, so the September meeting is a kind of mid, mid to late September. The election is November 5th. You're talking six weeks ahead of the election. Do you think they want to cut rates six weeks ahead of the election? They're in the ultimate no-win situation. Oh, do you know, I was about to ask, because around this time last year, we were looking, I think the U.S. had three banks wobble. And I'm just looking at my notes, you know, Silvergate, uh, Silvergate Bank, Silicon Valley Bank, and Signature Bank for the Australians listening. Um, and we've come to the same time this year, so basically 12 months forward, and you're now suggesting that there's actually a much bigger potential commercial, uh, commercial property price sort of sleeping in, in the banks. How long does something like that take to play out, especially well, uh, in a rise or a high rate environment? Yeah. Well, we must have done that interview uh, between March 12th and March 19th. You're right. It was about a year ago because there were three banks. You're exactly right. It was uh, Silver, Silvergate, Silicon Valley, and Signature. But two weeks later, Credit Suisse failed. It's a shock on wedding yes. between Credit Suisse and UBS, one of the biggest, oldest banks in the world. <laughs> And then, uh, thanks to the Swiss National Bank, and then uh, a few weeks later, actually at the end of April, maybe May 1st, uh, was um, uh, First Republic. And First Republic had $425 billion of uh, uh, um, uh, sorry deposits, but that was just lifted by J.P. Morgan because J.P. Morgan wanted the asset management business. So you actually had five, five major bank failures, the three you mentioned, and then two more in the coming weeks. Um, then, but what did the, uh, what did the F FDIC and the treasury do? They guaranteed every bank deposit in the United States because Silicon Valley bank, remember that sequence, March 12th was a, uh, sorry, March uh, 10th was a, uh, Friday night. And they said, uh, uh, Silicon Valley bank has failed. We've taken it over. This is an FDIC press release. 
Uh, we're only get, we're only insuring deposits up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's the legal limit. That's their insurance policy. Everything over that is uninsured. Uh, your money's gone. We're giving you a receivership certificate of uncertain value. We'll get back to you on what it's worth. Well, the the weekend it was practically like barbarians at the gate at the White House. Every billionaire in Silicon Valley, the crybaby billionaires, every entrepreneur, every start was, oh, you don't understand. That was our working capital. We're going to have to lay people off and discontinue our apps and stop our programs and uh, can't pay the rent and all this stuff. A lot of which was true, but, you know, don't put $20 million in one bank, you know, spread it around a little <laughs> bit or, or do some kind of hedging. Um, and by the way, people forget 90% of the startups fail anyway. So I'm not sure that having them fail under those circumstances was, was very different than what would have happened otherwise. But uh, that was enough to panic the Fed and the FDIC. So Sunday night, 48 hours after the Friday night press release, when they said all these deposits just went up in smoke, they said, they came out with another press release. They said, just kidding, they're all insured. Oh, and by the way, Cisco had, um, I think three billion, I wanna say $3 billion. Uh, there was a, a cryptocurrency exchange that had about the same, about $3 billion. There were a lot of companies that had hundreds of millions of dollars of deposits. The total deposits were about $140 billion, the Silicon Valley Bank, only 3% were insured. So 97% of $140 billion was ready to go up in smoke on Friday night. By Sunday, they said, no, just kidding. They're all insured. And then the Fed said, oh, by the way, every member bank in the system, now you're talking about trillions of dollars of assets. If you have U.S. government securities, send them to us. We'll give you par value in cash. But the point is they were only worth 70 cents on the dollar because, because interest rates had gone from 1% to 5%. Those five-year notes to ten-year notes on the books of the banks were had lost twenty to thirty percent of their value. So here's the Fed saying we'll give you a hundred percent of the value, even though they're only worth let's say eighty percent. I had a used car at the time. I said, "Would you take my used car for what I paid for it? That would be great." I'll, it's, it's not worth anything. It's fifteen years old, had a quarter million miles on it, but um, but that's what they did. That's the canary in the coal mine. Combine that with what I was describing about commercial real estate monetary tightening, and what we see are the ingredients for a series of bank runs, except what, again, going back to what I said earlier, what's the Fed going to do now? They've, they've already taken all the government securities and the FDIC has guaranteed all the deposits. How are you going to stop the run? I, I've got to admit, I would love to see uh, what rabbit you, I know you said they're out of rabbits. Maybe they're not pulling rabbits. Maybe they're pulling out raccoons or something out of their hat this yeah, time around. Right. Uh, now, Jim, we're going to rapidly run out of time. So I've got a couple more questions for you before I want to let you go. Uh, I think sitting from Australia, you know, obviously American politics are curious to us because it just, it goes for so long. Like we have a six week election campaign and done and dusted. Uh, but with Americans, you know, you've got this pre-selection, um, you whittle down your candidates rather than voting for a party like happens here. So we're um, basically watching it with interest, but also too, obviously what happens in American politics very much impacts Australia, especially sure. cause you know, you're our allies, you're our <laughs> big brother in the fight. So we right. rely on you guys. You're buying our submarines. So we, we like that even better. <laughs> Yes, oh, that's a whole, I would love to have that conversation, but we might run out of time today. Uh, let's talk about another Trump-Biden showdown. Now, this is really the third time it's happened. We've got 2015, or the 2016 election, then the 2020 election, and now coming up to 2024, here it goes again. Trump versus Biden. Now, a little bit, part of me is a little bit frustrated that you can't find a candidate there who's under 70. I don't right. understand how America can't put one of those up. But tell me... How do you see this election playing out? And I just want to throw in one anecdote that I read that I find interesting, and this was from an Australian anti-Trump supporter who said perhaps one of the benefits of Trump's winning this election again is that other countries will stop playing up because they're a little bit scared of what he may or may not do. So tell me, let's put your geopolitical hat on. How do you see this election playing out this year? Well, uh, a couple of things. Number one, uh, the scare, and I, I hear what you're saying, and you're absolutely right. I, I see those comments similar to that uh, all along. But, um, you know, anyone can have their own narrative or their own spin, but there's something called reality, um, and it's worth checking in every now and then. Trump was the first president since, oh, 
I don't know. Maybe uh, I'm not sure how far back you have to go. Uh, maybe Gerald Ford, who didn't start a war. He he. There were no wars. The Ukraine war was under uh, Biden. Uh, Obama. You know, we burned down Libya. You know, Gaddafi got a bullet in the eye and worse. So I'll leave out the details. Uh, you know, under George Bush, Saddam was hanged by the neck. Uh, we invaded Iraq in 2003. I love those people. Russia goes into uh, Ukraine. You're violating sovereign territory. What do you think the U.S. did in 2003? I mean, I'm not uh, – Russia-Ukraine discussion, that's a, that's another two-hour interview. But yeah, my, point is, my point is the U.S. So – when we invade people, it's okay. But if somebody else does, uh, you're violating international law, et cetera. But, and uh, Bill Clinton bombed Serbia. Um, and uh, George H.W. Bush, I believe, we invaded Panama. Uh and and so on and so uh, uh, oh in Reagan we had the Contras uh, you know and, you know and, so, and you just keep going back so Trump was the only president who did not start a war so I all the stuff about he's scary he's dangerous I look at their track record he's he who, he's the guy who flew to the demilitarized zone and met with uh, Kim Jong Un now whatever you think of Kim Jong Un and y'all you know, Trump's a publicity hound I'll grant that he's a showman. But uh, he did it, and he, they shook hands, and they had a, a long meeting. So um, Trump had a good dialogue with Putin. I mean, I can't think of a better natural alliance than the United States and Russia uh, you know, versus China, which is the main enemy. But somehow uh, U.S. policy elites who don't know anything, uh, they're worse than economists when it comes to that, have singled out Russia as the main enemy. Russia is not the main enemy. Russia and the United States would, would be very good natural allies vis-a-vis -vis China. You know, uh, Shay, I'm going to guess that you're a pretty good poker player. Uh, so uh, just a guess. But there's an old saying in poker, if you're in a three-handed game and you don't know who the sucker is, you're the sucker. <laughs> yes. It's always, no, it's always, two, it's always two against one. Two players, you know, can bind forces to clean out the other guy. And then they turn on each other. Well, we have a three-handed poker game. There are only three countries that really matter in the world, China, Russia, and the United States. Uh, You've got lots of allies, lots of important economies. I love Australia. Can't wait to get back. But it's really Russia, China, and the United States. It's a three-handed poker game. But right now, the U.S. is the sucker. It's Russia and China versus the United States. And people like Kissinger, which means we lose. People like Kissinger understood. See, what Kissinger and Nixon did, they cozied up to China to isolate the Soviet Union. And it worked. Soviet Union collapsed. Communism's gone. Here comes Putin, et cetera. But now it's time for the U.S. and Russia to join hands to isolate China. That's how you win the game. Thank you for watching the interview highlights of Jim Rickards. If you enjoy this highlight video, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.